I hope you've had a good week. We're starting to feel, I know we talked about this last week, but we're starting to feel some fall weather. And I'm, I don't know about you, but I am ready for it. Right? And uh, we're going to go ahead and open up to some worship uh, when He abides. Why don't you go ahead and stand with us? We want to invite you to stand as you are able. Text up on the screen. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you to everyone that made our homecoming service such a wonderful experience. And let me say also that um, the giving for our special project was absolutely outstanding. We raised enough money so that we can do the project. Isn't that wonderful? So we we're able to go ahead and begin the procedure for uh, putting putting in some walkways at the back and it will improve our property and thank you so much for your generous giving in fact the homecoming service was just a wonderful service in every way <clears throat> what a wonderful experience we enjoyed it the most to be sure and uh, makes me look forward to next year so already I do want to mention just a, a few prayer requests um, one of those is our own Angela Edwards. Her mother is in very poor shape, and she is home now. Um, but remember Miss Agnes, please, and your prayers. And also, some of you uh, know Beth McClam. She's a, a friend to this church. But her mother also is very poor. And um, 
I want you to continue to remember them. And I was just notified this morning of uh, Nicky Spell. I did not know him, but he was a friend to this church, and he came to this church, and and I and he passed away uh, this week. So uh, let's be in prayer for his family and uh, ask the Lord to comfort and encourage his family. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Father, you're so good, you're so kind, you're so wonderful. You love us. You love us all the time. You love us when things are good, when things are bad. Lord, you love us when, Lord, we're rejoicing. And you love us, Lord, when we need to be comforted because we're sad. Lord, we just thank you for your love and your kindness and your goodness. We ask your blessings upon all of these requests that have been made. You who know better than we how to meet those needs. We cast our cares upon you. Lord, we thank you for supplying all their needs according to your riches and glory. By Christ Jesus, we pray. We thank you, Lord, for the offering that we received this morning. Please bless, Lord, those who are responding and giving into the kingdom of God. Thank you, Lord, for your goodness. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. 
You can have it 
Lord, we are available to you. And we thank you that you are available to us. In fact, Lord, you made it so simple. You said, draw unto me and I will draw unto you. We're available to you and you immediately are available to us whenever we turn your way and face you. Thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your love for us. We honor you. We worship you this morning. You are our God. And there is none other besides you. There is none other but you. We love you and we praise you this morning. Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord forever. Glory to the Lord forever. Amen. You may be seated. Before I begin the, uh, the service, <coughs> bringing forth the Word of God this morning, I just want to share a note that was sent to me by Karen Satterfield with the loss of her husband, and it reads this way, thank you for your thoughts and prayers, it helped through this hard time, thank you for your food line gift card. It was much needed and appreciated. You showed the love of Christ. God bless you all in Christ, Karen Satterfield. Please we remember to pray for her, that the Lord would comfort her during this season after the passing of her husband. You know, it's these are the hardest days. Uh, you have family around you. You have friends around you. You have your church family around you. You have your neighbors around you immediately following the passing of a loved one. But it's in the weeks and months after that when it gets really, really difficult. So um, knowing that she's right here in our neighborhood, I want to encourage us all to occasionally stop by and say hi or call or send a note or do something to let her know that we're thinking about her. Amen? Amen. Well, we're going to start kind of a study. It's beginning to look like it might be a good series. I'm excited about it. We're going to begin to look into the book of Malachi. I'm going to begin by reading just the first verse of chapter 1. It reads this way. A prophecy, the word of the Lord to Israel through Malachi. Father, I pray your blessing upon the word of God. Lord, that as we minister based upon the word of God, Lord, that you will impart truth to us that will help us, Lord, to honor you and live more fully according to your will and purpose for our lives. Thank you, Father, that you have reached out to us and shown your abundant love for us. And we are here today because of that. We glorify and praise you, Father, for you are a God of love. And thank you that you loved us enough to send Jesus Christ to die for our sins. Hallelujah. And we bless your name, most holy God. Amen. The book of Malachi was written by the last of the minor prophets. Now they have the major prophet, prophets and the minor prophets, and they're not minor because they're less important. They're just minor because they wrote smaller books. That's the only reason they're called minor prophets. And this is the very last one. If you look in your Bible, he's the very last book in the Old Testament. Right before you turn the page into the New Covenant. It was written by a, a name uh, by which the book is entitled, Malachi. 
And it was written about a hundred years after the children of Israel were permitted to return to their homeland after the Babylonian captivity. You know, they were, they were taken to Babylon for 70 years they were there. And then God gave them favor, opened up the door, and all who wanted to go back to Jerusalem were permitted to do so. And there was a remnant who did. Ezra and Nehemiah, those are also books in the Bible, and it's talking about the work they did in rebuilding the walls and rebuilding the temple there at Jerusalem after the return of the remnant back to Jerusalem after the Babylonian captivity. They had reestablished the sacrifices for sin and the daily responsibilities of the priest at the temple. But now, 100 years later, the temple is in bad shape and needs to be repaired. And the people, those that are farmers are having poor crops because God has withheld the rains. In fact, things are not going very well at all for those at Jerusalem. This is not an easy word for Malachi the prophet to give because it's full of accusations from God about all the ways that the Israelites have failed to put God first in their lives. And all throughout the book of Malachi, God is making a case against his own people for their unfaithfulness to him. And he tells them that the very reason they are not prospering is because he has withheld his blessing from them. This book of Malachi also prophesies the coming of the greatest prophet to ever live, John the Baptist. That's what Jesus called him. He said he's the greatest prophet that ever lived. And even more importantly, Malachi prophesies that there will come a Lord, the Lord, who will purify Israel and prepare them for God's future kingdom. And we know that that Lord did come, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who brought salvation of sins to all men who will believe on him and eternal life instead of in an eternal hell to all, to all who will confess him as their Lord and Savior. And aren't you glad you did that? Amen. Amen. But you know, bad news, bad news is hard to hear, and it's also hard to be the barrier, bearer of bad news. I, I hate to be the one who brings bad news. How about you? I do. But the Amplified Bible gives us a little more insight into it. It reads this way, that first verse. The oracle or burdensome message of the word of the Lord to Israel through my messenger Malachi. See that word oracle, it means burden or burdensome message. This was a burdensome message. Whereas Happy are the feet of those who bring good news. I told you it's fun to bring good news. You like to have happy feet, don't you? When you are bringing bad news that just makes everyone angry at you, you don't have happy feet because the message from God here is a burden. It is heavy. It is hard. And it can crush your joy and crush your happiness. And that is exactly the effect that God wanted it to have in this place with this particular people. He is angry that they are disrespecting him and not honoring the law of Moses in their lives. That is the kind of message that Malachi is sharing from God to the people of Jerusalem. It's kind of a tough message. The book of Malachi is actually written as a series of six disputes. God will say something, and then the Israelites will disagree, disagree with it or dispute God's statement. Then God will respond to their dispute, and he will offer the last word. Don't you know God always has the last word? He does. 
He has the last word. You and I have had some complaints too, haven't we? From time to time. But I want you to know something. God always has the last word. In the first three disputes, God exposes Israel's corruption. And in the final three disputes, he confronts that corruption. There is not a record in the Bible of another prophet sent by God to speak to the people of Israel after the prophet of Malachi until 400 years later when John the Baptist comes on the scene as the forerunner of Jesus Christ who prepares the hearts of Israel for the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world. So let's look at the first of these six disputes between God and the Israelite people of Jerusalem. Verse 2 says, I have loved you, says the Lord. I have loved you. See, the way that God begins his discourse with his people is to tell them that he loves them. It doesn't sound like a complaint, does it? Not the way he began. I don't know that I have too much of a problem with God complaining at me if he's going to tell me he loves me first. Kind of takes the edge off it, off it a little bit. But God says to them, I love you. And, and in reality, God, who hears and knows all, the, all things, he is aware that his people, the Israelites, are not happy with the way their lives are going. Things aren't going well at all for them. They don't really feel like God loves them right now. That's why God said that. When the Israelites first returned from exile, their hopes were high. They thought they would return and rebuild their lives. They thought they would secure the city of Jerusalem by rebuilding the walls, which they did, and rebuilding the temple, which they did. All the words of the prophets would then come true. A Messiah would come and set up a unified kingdom over Israel and all the nations of the world. And then he would bring justice, righteousness, and peace for all. But it didn't happen that way. It didn't happen the way they thought it would. The Israelites who returned to Jerusalem turned out to be just as unfaithful as their ancestors, resulting in injustice and poverty that was pervasive throughout, throughout the whole city of Jerusalem. You see, although God loves us, he does not bless us when we are in a sinful rebelliousness against him. The book of Hebrews talks about their ancestors, and it seems their faith was, was just as weak as their forefathers' faith. Right now, he's going to talk about what their forefathers' faith was. In Hebrews chapter 3, verse 12, Beware, brethren, lest there be any of you, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief, and departing from God. That is how God described their forefathers. Now, when I'm talking about their forefathers, I'm referring to the Israelites who were delivered from the Egyptian captivity. Remember how God delivered them. Moses did all those wonderful miracles. God brought those miracles through Moses. I'm part of the Red Sea, and they walked across it on dry ground. Miracle after miracle. It didn't matter how many miracles God performed in order to save them from their oppressors and provide food and water for them. They never, ever learned to put their trust in God. God was so tired of their whining and complaining, their doubt and unbelief, and their unwillingness to trust Him, that He declared none of them above the age of 20 would He permit to cross over into the promised land. You see, they had an evil heart of unbelief. When we have unbelief in our hearts, God cannot do big things in our lives. When we have, because we have to believe that God will keep his word to us and that all of his promises to us are true. The Bible says the promises of God are yea and amen. It means they're all true for us. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 6, gives us a little more insight. 
But without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he who comes to God must believe that he is. And that he is the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. God will always reward us when we have faith in him. And when we don't give up on him. We must believe in him. And we must diligently seek him. Diligently seeking has two connotations. One is in the immediate we diligently seek him. But also diligently seeking him is that you don't give up seeking him or trusting in him when the journey becomes long and the prayer that you have prayed doesn't get answered in a short amount of time. That's the hardest time of, of trial to have is a long trial. It's hardest to believe God and trust God over a long period. But even if even if the consequences and it's more painful and it's harder, if it's just a short temptation, that's easy. But the long ones, oh, they just wear us out over time. Sometimes God has to speak the truth to us about attitudes and actions that are not pleasing to him. But he always loves us, no matter how much we may doubt him and fail him. Even if he has to withhold his blessings and punish us, still God loves us. And that's exactly what he tells these unbelieving Israelites. Though he is angry with them, he begins by telling them that he loves them. When things are going bad, one of the first things that happens to us is that we begin to doubt that God really does love us. Because if God loved us, then why would God allow such terrible things to happen to us? But in God's response to the Israelites' unbelief that God loves them, he gives them an unusual proof of his love. He tells them that, that he loves them, and the proof of it is because he chose them to be first among his people. And I'm going to read those verses and we'll give an explanation that refer to this little, little section here. But you ask, how have you loved it? You see, there's, there's, there's the response of God said, I love you. And they said, I don't think so. How? How can you say you love us when all this stuff is going on bad in our life? He said, well, I'm going to show you. He said, I love you because I picked you. I could have picked someone else to be my people, but I picked you. This is God's response. Was not Esau Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau have I hated. I have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. Verse 4. Edom may say, though we have been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. Who's Edom? Edom are the descendants of Jacob's brother Esau, the Edomites. Okay, so there's Jacob, the Israelites that came out of him. And there's, there's Esau and the Edomites that came forth out of him. Two nations of people. So Edom, the descendants of Esau, may say, though we've been crushed, we will rebuild the ruins. But this is what the Lord Almighty says. They may build, but I will demolish. They will be called the wicked land, a people always under the wrath of the Lord. You will see it with your own eyes and say, great is the Lord even beyond the borders of Israel. That doesn't sound very much like a loving God to the Edomites, does it? Well, we're going to explore that a little bit. How is it possible for God to say that he hated Esau, but he loved Jacob, even while they were both just newborn babies? There is something that we fail to really understand about God. God exists in the past and in the present and in the future, all at the same time. See, time has no control for God at all. God is not bound by time or by space. God knows all things. God is everywhere at the same time, and God is all-powerful. 
There is none other anywhere, nor has there ever been, nor will there ever be anyone like unto God. God is in a whole category, completely into himself. You cannot care, compare any other God. There's no comparison whatsoever. It don't exist. This is, great, this is the great dilemma that Satan finds himself in. He doesn't have the attributes of God, but he wants to be as of God, as God. But he can't be. It is impossible. God alone is the creator of all things. And no one is even in the same category to be compared with him. So when these twins were born, God knew right then and there that Esau would never have a heart for him. He didn't cause it, but he knew it. That he would have an evil heart of unbelief. That he would sell his birthright for a bowl of soup. That he would marry women who were foreign women who worshipped other gods, which brought great grief to his mother and father's heart. God knew that Esau would never have any interest in eternal spiritual things. At the same time, he knew that Jacob, though he was a trickster and a deceiver, would one day care about the things of God. So God picked Jacob to be the one of these two babies from which Jesus, his son, the Savior of all the world, would one day come. God also knew that the descendants of Esau, the Edomites, would always hate the descendants of Jacob, the Israelites, God knew that they would go out of their way and make it their mission to hurt and harm the seed of Jacob. That is why God intentionally makes it difficult for the Edomites to prosper. The Edomites have given themselves over to the devil to become a weapon against Israel and God will intervene and make sure that Israel is not destroyed by them. Why? Because Christ will come forth from the seed of Jacob and that lineage must be preserved. And aren't you glad it was preserved? John Wesley, that great revivalist, the one who began the concept of small group Bible study from which came our understanding of Sunday school. We, I had, we love Sunday school. The one, the one who was greatly responsible for the hymns that have been sung for generations becoming a part of our worship service. And the one who is called the father of the Methodist church from which the Pentecostal Holiness Church came. Now, I just, I know that my home church, Goshen, in 1900, came right out of the Goshen Methodist Church right down the street. We have, as our father, the Methodist church, in a sense. That's what I'm trying to say. We come right out of the Methodist church. This same man was the one who said, God's foreknowledge does not foreordinate. Well, what does that mean? It means that just because God knows something does not mean that God caused it in the first place. God knows everything that happens under the sun because he exists in the past, the present, and the future at the same time, and nothing about us is hidden from him. I do not pretend to understand that. I'm just stating the fact, y'all. God is different than anyone else in all of creation. No one, no one is like what I just described of God himself. I believe nobody else could handle it besides God. So even though God knows things, he doesn't love any less. Even though he knows things, he doesn't Keep that evangelist from crossing the track of that person. And he, he might know that they won't receive, but he knows. But he sends anyway. Because God's love is, 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 is boundless. His love is boundless. In fact, it is true. God is love. So God says to Israel, I chose your father Jacob because I knew he had a heart to believe in me. 
And he is also saying, I have deliberately intervened on your behalf against those whose heart it is to destroy you because I love you and I am for you. And I want you to know something. God also chose you. He chose you because he loves you. That is the reason you're here today in this church. There is something in you that wants to know God and be known by God. That is why you got up this morning and chose to come to church. And God loves that about you. See, you are demonstrating that you love the Lord. And that His love has touched your life. Or else you, you wouldn't even be here this morning. But did God really hate these people? I'm talking about the Edomites. No, He didn't. Another translation helps us understand a little better what God was really saying. And I, I had this understanding from the Amplified Classic Bible. Let me read a, a portion of it. I have loved you, says the Lord, yet you say how and in what way have you loved us? Was not Esau Jacob's brother? Yes, the Lord. Yes, says the Lord. Yet I loved Jacob, Israel. But in comparison with the degree of love I have for Jacob, I have hated Esau or Edom. See, he didn't say he hated them. He just said he loved Jacob much, much more. He still loved the Edomites. And it, and it grieved his heart that they rejected him. It always grieves God's heart when people reject him. It wounds and it hurts him. That is the depth of the love that he has. But there's a difference in the love that he has for those who accept his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, and ask him to come in their lives and give their heart and lives to him and give their service to him. I will tell you, it makes a difference that you have said yes to Jesus. So we, hear the, we see here that God did not really hate the Edomites, but was drawing a comparison between the Edomites and the Israelites and describing the difference in his affection for the two. God loves everyone, but God loves those who are his beloved more. They are the apple of his eye, his most precious possession. Oh, but Satan wants us to think that God does not love us. Remember the first recorded lie of Satan in the Bible. He said to Eve, did God say that you can't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? He does not really love you. He's trying to deprive you of something very wonderful. He wants to keep the knowledge of good and evil all to himself. He's being selfish and trying to deprive you of something special, really special. See, Satan questioned God's motive for withholding the fruit of that tree. Satan questioned God's love for Eve. That's why God said, even to a time when he's, he was disciplining his own people, he said first, I want you to know I'm disciplining you because I love you. Not because I don't love you. It's because I love you. <clears throat> Satan will always tell you and I the same lie. He's told me that lie before. Has he ever told you? God doesn't love you. You're not lovable. He says that we are not worthy of God. And he's right about that. He will say we're not good enough for God. And he is right about that. He will say we have nothing worthy to give to God. And guess what? He is right about that. And he will always say that God does not really love us. And he is wrong about that. Totally, completely, unquestionably wrong about that. God has always loved us. Even when we were just an idea in his mind, God loved us. While we were still sinners, God loved us and sent Jesus to save us. 
Romans chapter 5 and 6 says it. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, why were we powerless? Because we were lost and undone without hope in the world. We didn't have Jesus as our Lord and Savior. We were powerless. But when we were powerless, what happened? Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. So let us make up our minds now and for forevermore that God loves us. No matter how hard life gets, know this. God loves you. No matter how sad or depressed you may become, know this. Your God loves you. No matter how unloved you may feel from your family or from others outside your family, know this. Your God loves you. You cannot run from his love. You cannot hide from his love or even deny that God loves you because it is an absolute unchangeable fact. Your God loves you so much that he sent his only precious son to earth to die for your sins and for mine. And why did he do this? There can be only one reason. It is undeniable because he loves us more than he loved his own life. I have a question for you. Do you feel unloved, Josh? Do you feel that you're really not worthy of God or has situations of life, people in your life so crushed your image of yourself that you can't even conceive that God really does love you. I'm going to tell you something. He does. He loves you with a boundless love with an ever-growing love, with a love that's incomprehensible to us in our finite little minds. He was in love with the very thought of us before he ever created us, and then he carried us within himself, and then that just at the proper time, after he had written a sense of destined purpose upon us, he sent us out into the world, and he chose where we would go. had great dreams about what we could accomplish. Even the Edomites, he had great dreams for them too. But not everybody will choose God. Sadly. But God chose them. But you know, you can't have God if you don't choose God. You have to choose Him. As much as He loves you, you can't go to heaven unless you accept him as your Savior. It's not because God doesn't want it to be that way. It's because it's fact. It's like gravity. It's a spiritual law. It won't work any other way. It's impossible for us to enter into heaven without accepting Jesus Christ as our Savior. Amen. But for those of you who are saved, don't listen to that old lie of the devil that God doesn't love you because things are hard. Because people have hurt you. Because someone has rejected you. Because what you've gone through in, in this life seems to be the fruit that everybody around you really doesn't understand you and doesn't love you. So look beyond everyone. Look to the one who loves you completely, always has loved you. And will show you that love if you'll open up to him and let him he'll show you that he loves you. He wanted to say to the Israelites, yes, I had to let some tough things happen because you weren't looking at me. You weren't paying attention to me. 
But now that I've got your attention, I want you to know I love you. I love you. With all my being, I love you. Hallelujah. Would you close your eyes with me? I just wonder, is there anyone among us that feels a little crushed? Unloved? By life? By others? This is not the call or the kind of call this morning that I'm going to ask you to come forward because I feel like this is a really personal thing. But if you feel that way, you're feeling really unloved, and that you need the affirmation of God. You need Him to show you that you, how He loves you. It's, just raise your hand so I can pray with you. Anyone? Anyone else? Come on. I can't be the only one in life that's been crushed. I can't be the only one in life that's been rejected by others and feels the woundedness, woundedness of them. I'm going to tell you, I'm going to be 70 years old, but I am still being healed from the rejection of man. I mean, it's current. Currently, currently something that God is working in me. Fear of man that God is dealing with. You know what? You don't have to be afraid of man. Just look to God. He loves you. Hallelujah. He cares about you. Like none other ever will or can. Father, I just thank you, Lord, for your love upon you. Especially those who raise their hands. To assure them that you are with them. And that when you say, and lo, I am with you always, even into the world, that you, into the world, that you mean every word of it. They're not going to walk alone. It doesn't matter what journey life takes them to, what destination in life that, that they have to travel. Lord, you will be with them all the way. And you'll be a, their help in the time of trouble. Hallelujah. You'll give them the strength that they need. For the eyes of the Lord start throughout the earth to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed unto you. Lord, because they've committed this to you, you're going to strengthen them. You're going to help them. And they will know that you are their God and that they are your beloved child. Their beloved son, their beloved daughter. Lord, I thank you for your grace upon us both to accept any discipline you might be bringing into our life, but also to understand and accept all the love that you desire to bestow upon us. Lord, we're answering the question. The question is, does God really love us? Well, the answer is unquestionably, yes, 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 God does love us. No matter what we're going through or what we will go through, it has nothing to do with it. You love us with a, a boundless love. It can never be measured. And we thank you, Father, that we know everything is well with us because we know your love for us. Now, Lord, I pray your blessing upon this congregation throughout this week. Whatever walk of, of life that, that they may be, be on, whatever path that they may be walking, Father, throughout this week, I pray, they will feel and know, Lord, your presence, which is evidence of your love for us. They, they will receive your encouragement and let you come into their lives to bring, Lord, the help that you desire to. Father, thank you that you loved us so much that you sent your precious son, Jesus Christ, to die for us. And we just receive that love. In Jesus' name we pray.
Amen. Amen. God bless you.